I'm not too familiar with. Um, but as with all of our discussions, we hope that you sort of jump in and uh, make this interactive as well. And so we welcome your, dis your, your questions, your comments to advance the discussion. But without further ado, let me welcome Tony Bertoldi, who is a, um, uh, an authority in this unique space of affordable housing and the author of uh, The American Dream Come True. Uh, Tony, really been looking forward to this and, uh, and eager to kind of dive in and learn more about uh, your thoughts on affordable housing. But before we do that, let's get to know you a little bit better. Tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to this interesting career path. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and thank you for inviting me to join you today. Um, you know, I'm passionate about affordable housing and I'd love to talk about it. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, <clears throat> we often joke, and I actually write about this in the book, that people that find themselves in this business um, never really knew that they would be here. Um, and, you know, we, we refer to ourselves as a land of misfit toys because, um, you know, we all, when we were in college, the LIHTC program, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program that we'll talk about today was just enacted by Congress. So there was no coursework, there was no major, there was no career path in this business, but most of us found our way here through, you know, just different opportunities. Um, I entered the space about 30 years ago um, and in a, on a consulting basis, uh, working for uh, someone who is referred to as the grandfather of uh, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Uh, sadly, he has since passed away. But then I took a position with a tax credit syndicator here in Boston. Um, a syndicator is a, a company that sort of pairs together the um, investment dollars in this space and the developers who build the housing. Um, and then we manage the, the assets for, uh, for the compliance period. So I started there for about 10 years there, and then I joined Korea, my current employer, about 15 years ago. And I serve in the capacity of co-president of Korea in our Boston office. And 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 your company. Uh, so, I mean, you wrote a book that's on the right. a lot of the topics that we're going to talk about today. That's right. Yeah. But, but your company builds affordable housing for all ages. That's that right. Work? OK, well, well, well yes. Um, what and I'm happy to give you the cliff notes. Um, our company finances the affordable housing. The affordable housing is has what we refer to as a general partner or a developer. These are companies across the U.S. who find the land, do the plans and specs, get the permitting. And then they come to us and they say, I need money to build this. And we invest the money into the properties. In exchange for that, we receive back these federal tax credits that our investors, which are household names, you know, think of the largest banks in the country, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citibank, think of the largest insurance companies in the, in the country, New York Life, Prudential, Allstate. They invest in this space through our funds their money goes into the deals to make the deals work. And in exchange for that, they get back a tax credit. Okay. Now, um, before we turn the the mics and cameras on, yeah. for, for all of you in the audience, uh, Tony and I were chatting. And uh, what the area that I was not aware of that you, that you are an expert in is... Uh, this low income housing and tax credit program. That's right. Which yep. Is called LIHTC in the industry, correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to drop a, 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 a link in there uh, so everybody can, you know, read and learn a little bit more about it and, and do internet searches if you'd like, but, yep. but out of curiosity. So, you know, one of the things that I that we see out there in the senior living space is you've got, you know, communities that are b being built for older adults that um, have assets and wealth. OK, 
And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got low income housing, y y you know, yep. but there's this huge gap in between the that now they call it the forgotten middle. And um, yep. uh, and and I imagine the tax credit housing is one option to help that group in the middle. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's important to note when you sort of when you think about affordable housing, I think most people's minds move to a HUD program or maybe what they would refer to as public housing. And, and that's not really what this is. Right. Okay. This is affordable housing where the tenants pay rent, but their rent is sized to their income. It's, it's a form of subsidy, but these are tenants that are paying to live in these units. But again, size to their income. And just to fast forward a little bit, if you think about seniors who are on a fixed income stream, maybe Social Security or a pension, they would be ideal candidates for affordable housing. Yeah, uh, and, and especially those older adults that you know, they don't qualify for, for, you know, public housing, or something. housing right. but they may not have the means to afford the market rate that's out there. Now, that's right. Yeah. Now, out of curiosity, like mm -hmm. the, before this LIHTC program, um, and, and if the LIHTC program didn't exist, would, if developers were just left to their own devices, would they even build something for the middle market? Well, they can't, you know, the issue is that they can't afford to build it without the tax credits, right? right? And so, and the tax credits are what make the units affordable because if you think it, you know, and I don't want to get too technical, but on a traditional market rate development, there's going to be debt from a lender and some equity piece from the developer. On a LIHTC deal, the credits, the amount of the credits are substantial and those decrease the amount of debt that the developer needs. And because there's lower debt, they can afford to rent the units at lower rents. And that's, you know, essentially how it works laid out more specifically in the, you know, in the, uh, in the book, but, but, um, you know, a couple of things I want to note. So I, and I mentioned this to you earlier, Steve, 90% of all affordable housing in the United States over the past about 40 years has been built under the LIHTC program. Not wow. HUD, not public housing. Okay, and, and yeah. Oh, but before, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, I've, I've seen some chatter in the uh, in, in yeah. chat there, but but let's define, like, can you, can you <laughs> define uh, affordable housing? And, and, and somebody made a comment about, Hey, look, this is affordable rental housing. Okay. It's it, it is. Um, because yeah, we're in talking general, this market is that we're serving yeah. is not accumulating wealth to put a down payment and take care of the maintenance of a property. This is a middle market uh product. But but yeah. is there are there some definitions of what this is in terms of income? Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh to 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 sort of set the stage about one third of Americans rent their homes versus own. So you're talking about over a hundred million people, right? And our area is specifically related to rental income. This is not a program. There are, and it's a national program, but there are countless state and local and federal programs that will help first time home buyers or, or other forms of subsidy like section eight, public housing, um, you know, uh, 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 other forms of, you know, in New York, it's called eShy, any number of things. But specifically, and, and I see Maggie has a question, I will answer that. Um, it's defined as 55, and in some cases, 62. So I'll be 57 this summer, so I'm right in that sweet spot. But um, seniors in the LIHTC area are generally 55 and above. Okay. And the definition of affordable is that the units are rented to tenants who make 60% of the, 
of the area median income or less. I want everyone on this call to think about this as workforce housing, not free housing or government handouts. These are teachers, hairdressers, people who work at Starbucks, people who work at hotels, people who work at retail, the person driving the bus, the dog walker, firemen, police officers. This is workforce housing at its purest form, but those tenants are not overburdened with having to pay market rent. They pay 30% of their income and they have to make 60% or less of their income to qualify. All right. And, you know, I'm going to give Stephen Katz in the audience a, uh, a gold star today because he said, you know, most affordable housing developers pursue the sweet spot of 60% of That's right. their median income. Great job. And I want to, I want to uh, thank you, Stephen. I want to touch on something you mentioned about that sort of in between, because in the past four or five years, there's been a new type of lie tech that will go up to 80% of AMI. It's something that we refer to as average income. I don't want to bore you with, you know, with uh, with the details. If a developer decides to rent some of the units to 80% AMI, they then also have to rent some at a lower percentage. So it still averages to 60. But okay. that taps into more of that workforce, right? Taps into, and if you think about so the Boston area where I live is has an area median income of about $65,000. So 60% of that, somewhere in the $40,000 range, would qualify for this workforce housing for seniors or families. Our portfolio at CREA is about uh, 9,000 units. About 30% of those are rented to seniors. Wow, okay. Well, yeah, there's a specific set aside, we call it. I'm sorry, there's a specific set aside, which is the developer has to identify in their application process who they're going to rent to. And they can choose seniors or they can choose families. They can go further and receive what we call favorable points and identify another population of need, disabled, formerly homeless, veterans, we have an entire program for veterans, which you know I challenge anyone to say that a veteran doesn't deserve a place to live, um, a, a safe, affordable, clean place to live. Um, so those specific target populations are part of the program, but about a third of our units house seniors. That, this is this is great. Now here's the 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 big question that I have, and I know that others do. It's sort of how do I find this? Like if I if yeah. if I feel that I might qualify, if I've got a parent that might qualify, I I I in my community there's a new senior living apartment or community that was built, and the only way it could be built is if they had a set amount of workplace housing units. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> but how would I find this for my yeah. For my um, and I noticed in the chat, um, Christian Smith from our marketing team, my sidekick during this venture, uh, posted a link to our website. Our website will include some resources, but specifically what I wanted to get at is it has some photos of our affordable housing portfolio. And the, the point I'm going to make is that um, the affordable housing communities generally look like any other piece of real estate. You know, you when when you see public housing driving around urban areas, you know what public housing looks like. It's a two story brick flat roof built in the 70s, ugly real estate. That's not what we're talking about here. So in terms of the curb appeal and the amenities that are offered and the and the apartments that are available, we're talking about market rate like real estate. Now, how you can find it becomes a little bit more of a difficult task quite often the apartment will be listed in the various catalogs like rent.com or other resources as either affordable or federally subsidized, or, you know, in some cases they may say HUD financed, which is, you know, they, they could be HUD financed. You can go to the, each state has its own allocating agency for this business. So you can go to those and, 
as a resource, find the listing of properties in the state that are low income. You could also go to the local housing authority. Most cities and states will have a housing authority and they can be a resource to identify properties as well. And then I, I was just clicking around on your website, which I'll make sure to share as well. But like, th this is your first, this is your company's portfolio. That's right. Uh, yeah. So what we can see is, is that there's this type of housing all over the country. How much would you say outside of your portfolio, how many units are, are represented nationwide right now uh, in yeah. this? A segment we're our, our um you know do a little math i mean our, i think our market share is about five percent of the business and so if you take uh nine thousand divided by 0.05 um uh, that's that's not sounding right but um the program has been in existence since 1986 it is tied to per capita meaning the number of people in each state it's a formula that amount has been increasing over time. So, you know, I would I would venture to guess it's millions of units that have been developed by the affordable housing program. Okay. Great, yeah. great. Now, yeah. um, Irv has a question and and I'd, I'd love uh, your feedback on this one because I'm curious yeah. about it too. Affordable housing for older adults tends to segregate older people from younger generations. Do these types of communities or other mechanisms include older people with others rather than segregating? So yeah. are there, there are buildings that have all ages but do support older adults? Yeah, um, there, there are some examples that would address this. I mean, it is, it is true that the developments choose either senior or family tenancy. In some cases, they can do mixed tenancy. In some cases, in other words, seniors are not disallowed from renting in a family property. So you could have seniors in a family property. You could have sister properties side by side, one being family, one being senior. Um, given the nature of what we're talking about, our properties tend to be more urban and suburban versus rural. So they're in close proximity to other networks and other types of properties. But of interest, there are a couple of pilot programs. There's one on a deal that we did in Portland, Oregon, where um, the seniors at the property commit to uh, essentially foster, um, foster children that are you know, otherwise homeless or need a place to stay and kind of blending together you know, that yeah, did you, that's what state is that in? Do you do you recall? Oregon, Portland. Oh, okay, Oregon. because there was a I I remember years ago an innovative yeah. community in um in Ohio that was a it was a military base that was shut down and they did that same model and I think that is just a brilliant design where Absolutely. the older adults can yeah. help families adopting foster kids. Um, there's a community in the DC area that was open last year where it was specifically designed for, um, grandparents raising grandchildren. And exactly. Those, those are all set aside that are possible. And, you know, I, I, and I've been meaning to mention this, but it's, it's very relevant to what we're talking about. The, the LIHTC, the, the low income housing tax credits can be awarded to a property that will be an assisted living facility. Korea has closed, this is an up and coming area. So I wouldn't want to suggest that it's a large percentage of uh, the population, but Korea has closed on three of these such properties. So they are full service assisted living facilities, but they're financed in part by the LIHTC credit. So these would be applicable to lower income individuals who need assisted living facilities. I will say that the assisted living in this business is not generally uh, well accepted at the moment because it, it's um, it's more like underwriting a business than underwriting a piece of real estate because you have the services and the food and the nursing and and the you know 
providing the the uh, medical assistance and the CNAs and all of that. So it's a slightly different spin, but I, I I write about this in the book in that I think that this is going to be an increasing part of the business that I hope to see develop because of our aging population. But we need to work, work around a few more guardrails on how the investment itself works. Um, and let's see, Irv, again, Irv, you get a gold star today too because he's already... <laughs> done a little bit of research on um, that foster uh, community. Are you, is this the one that you're referring to bridge meadows? It may be. I'm not, I don't remember the name. Is it in okay. Portland? Yeah, it's in Portland. And yes, uh, um, actually that courtyard that you just went through, I visited. So yes. Oh the, yeah. <laughs> Look yeah. at this place. It, okay. Yeah. It, and it, it, so here I'll, I'll drop this in. Thanks for finding that Irv. Um, and, and you know what? I uh, actually, Tony, if you can uh, give us a connection to uh, Bridge Meadows, uh, I know that our uh, our our community would love to uh, hear some stories about what it's like to live at that community. That is just a, an amazing uh, project. But but what when when I look at that beautiful community you know yeah. like you said it's not doesn't look like what we would think to be subsidized not public housing. Not public um, it actually the design resembles um uh a co-housing com community and uh somebody was asking uh I, i'm not sure if you're familiar with co-housing but co-housing is a uh, a model where people intentionally help each other. Uh, you move right. in here and, and you are living in a co-housing community and you are willing to help your, your fellow neighbors. They were wondering, uh, and I can't see where the person that asked this question, but they, um, uh, they were wondering, have you ever heard of co-housing being under this, this type of, um, right. You know, because there are very specific rules about how much the tenants make and what the rent would be as a result of that, there is nothing that prevents two people from renting a unit together, but the incomes would be combined for those purposes, right? So it just depends on what the math is. Um, I, I, I do want to highlight a New York State pilot program that's underway right now around accessory dwelling units, which is very similar to what you're talking about. Um, New York State is offering, under this pilot program, is offering single family homeowners $350,000 to build an ADU on their property. And that $350,000 may sound like a lot of money. Of course, it's intended to house seniors or other adults that can't find housing or can't afford housing. Um, but what the state understands is that the cost to build new housing, and of course we're talking about the urban areas, right? We're not talking about in upstate New York, we're talking about in the city and in the surrounding areas. The cost to build that housing in some cases would be two or three times $350,000. And so since this is a resource that they have, they would rather pay for this than to build the housing. I think it's a great program. Yeah, I think this is it. I'll drop it in, but um you know, my yeah. uh, sometimes <laughs> my um You're very good. You're very good with the uh, the internet skills here. So oh yeah, good. no, it's uh Have well because you know what it is our our my our our audience has trained me this way because no matter what somebody brings up, the que the next question is Hey, what about that program? It's like you brought up the foster, uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. foster program, um, and uh, and yeah, and Jerry's like, hey, can you drop that, Jerry? I dropped that in already for you, buddy. Um, the um, uh, okay, um, now, so we've got millions of these units, but yes. um, we need more. We need more. So, yeah. is there a vision in place, and how can we? How can we make this more widespread in our communities? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, we, we've we kind of laid the groundwork that this is a effectively a government-sponsored program, but it's a public-private partnership, perhaps one of the most successful public-private partnerships this country has seen. Um, but it is 
funded by these tax credits, which come from the U.S. government. Um, there is a tax bill. So I am I'm a board member and executive committee member of the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition, um, Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition, AHTCC.org. Another resource that I think people okay. should go to. Okay. AHTCC.org, Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition. So the coalition is essentially a, you know, call it a lobbying group. Of course, we're a member. There's 250 to 300 members of the coalition. And um, <clears throat> our goal is to expand, enhance, and preserve the low-income housing tax credit. So we have been working on a bill. The bill is called the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. That bill has 220 co-sponsors in the in the House of Representatives, and it has over. Um, uh, sorry, it's the Democrats are of course on board, but it's the Republicans that are important. But it has uh, 20 co-sponsors in the in the Senate. Portions of that bill were included in what you were just referencing on the screen a $78 billion tax bill. That $78 billion tax bill contains really three major components. One is an R&D credit. The other is a child tax credit. This is an expired provision that expired a couple of years ago that Congress is trying to reenact. And then there's a small piece for LIHTC, $6 billion for LIHTC. The balance is the R&D and the child tax credit. This bill, is 100% paid for. So in, in, in Congress, you can't present something without figuring out how you're gonna pay for it. It's being paid for by the um, retraction of an employee retention credit that was introduced during COVID and is no longer needed. And it's said that this is the first time a pay for has been introduced without any lobbyists lobbying to keep it. So this is great news. The bill, which contains some of the provisions in our bill, passed the House of Representatives by a 357 uh, positive vote. Now, remember, you only need about 218 in order to, to pass. And anyone who's following what's going on with, and the tax bill looks like it was just posted in, in, the, in the chat. If anyone's following what's going on in DC, there has not been unanimous support or close to unanimous support for anything in the past 10 years, but 357 House of Representatives voted in favor of this. That bill is sitting in front of the Senate right now and may be stalled. And so I ask if any of you have any connections to a senator in your state and you're interested in affordable housing, write, call, or text them to support this bill. It's, we're hopeful, fingers crossed, that Majority Leader uh, Schumer brings it up when they return from recess. If the bill passes, it will. It's estimated that it will generate an additional, in, in addition to what we're doing now, an additional two hundred thousand units of affordable housing over the next two years, and then it would be up for you know renewal at the end of December in twenty twenty five. The Trump tax laws expire. They expire on, on essentially everything except for the corporate tax rate. So individual tax rates will go up and a number of other things expire. So this bill, if it passes, gets us through December of 2025 and then the fight starts again to continue you know, more funding. It, and you know, this is like one of those areas, like I was saying earlier, is, is that a left to our own devices, home home builders are not going to build these communities if there's not a program like this in place. There needs to be incentives because yep. the value of that land uh, and right. building yep. a market rate product is um, is you know there, there, there's no incentive. There's um, no way to do it. And there, there was a slightly controversial article published in the Wall Street Journal last week talking about some developers in L.A. that are pursuing permanent supportive housing for homeless 
without the LIHTC program, hmm. and, you know, I almost don't want to mention this because there's so much more to the story, but they're doing so because the LIHTC program is just full of regulations, right? And there's yeah. all of these requirements and compliance and whatnot. And if they're able to do it outside of that, and they're getting private funding to do so, then now this is a microcosm of the entire United States and there's lots of other things going on, but yes, it is nearly impossible to develop this type of housing without the subsidy from our tax credits. Yeah, it takes a lot of creativity. One of my friends, uh, Kathleen, has created an innovative community in Kensington, Maryland called Crossway Community, but and she said the same thing. It's like yeah. the regulations that I have to jump through, I just got to, you know, I'm going to do it differently, raising funds and, and people right. helping each other and what have you. And I think to Stephen Katz's point, the, the I, I I'm I'm kind of curious and excited about blending the co-housing with LIHTC and seeing if there's a solution there because the efficiency of co-housing um it enables uh costs to be lowered because the community is helping each other. Um so right. um yeah. now Dixie or even, oh, go ahead even micro housing now for some people that may be listening they they, you know, they may not want to consider micro units, but if you're, if you want to live in a city and you're comfortable living in a city and your network is in a city, micro units are a lower cost alternative and it can be financed with, with um, LIHTC. It's a lower cost alternative to producing a perfectly fine living uh, unit for, for some people, it's not for everyone. Um, but for some people. Yeah. And I, I here, I'll drop in an article that I just found on micro housing as well, but the, I, wrote um, a, I wrote a blog about it and Kristen just put it in the chart. Oh, awesome. Well. Okay. Then I'm yeah. not going to drop. Thank what you, I Kristen. Did. I didn't know uh, you would be. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Uh, the, the one good thing, because you're talking about policy and legislation, a lot of our community is in the Washington DC area and actually Dixie says Washington DC is home of a true champion of uh, for affordable housing which is jubilee housing and uh i don't know if this is one of your clients but um and they're a developer uh, yeah yeah but uh but uh jubilee has um uh they, they she says they developed over 18 buildings for well-deserving low-income families. What sets them apart is their vision for justice housing, wraparound services within the community for senior wellness. And uh, I love that term, justice housing. And you can see they've uh, they've registered, registered that trademark. That's that's pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah, now, it, th this reminds me, Steve, that it's important to know when I talk about the developers that are on the, on the other side, um, you know, probably a third of the developers that we work with are nonprofits, and many of them have very specific missions. Some of them can be specific to senior housing, but there's a whole variety of, of, of different missions. And so the nonprofit developer world is very involved and vibrant in the LIHTC community. Okay, really good questions here from Retta. And uh, she's got a few of them and she numbered them. So I'm going to hit you with these. Okay, okay so I'm not sure I'm seeing these on the chat. Would I see all of the questions on the chat? Or You should, but it, it's kind of hard to, to I'll, I, I like reading okay. them because we do these as a podcast too. So that way, if somebody's just listening, but uh, Retta says, what's included under the rent in most of these communities and and um you know she yeah, sort of no, says I, I see it now so the um there's a, there's a lot of formulas and so what happens is if you are going to charge for example for parking then the, the developer cannot include the cost of building that parking in their basis for the credits in other words it's all about not double dipping in a basic in a basic lease it's going to be rent and then whatever HUD says the utility allowance is for that area. That's kind of the basic. Okay. There may be some, um, you may have to pay, you know, to use the common laundry area. If you pay for parking, then the developer can't double dip. 
But other amenities like security or, you know, favorable amenities like, um, you know, in some cases in the in the warm states, you have car washing facilities and and you have um, outdoor grilling areas. You might have a tennis court or a swimming pool. Those are just amenities that are used to attract the right kinds of tenants. But okay. the lease itself is basically just rent and an allowance for utilities. So now Who, her, her question here is great. Is since you get a federal tax credit, is the lease reviewed and approved by the government or is it by the owner? Yeah. So the great thing about this program is once the allocating agencies grant the tax credits, they are pretty much not involved. They do an annual compliance review of the property, but the properties are privately managed, right? This is this public-private partnership. So the developer, of course, has to abide by the rules, and it's our job as the investment manager to make sure that they abide by the rules. But the lease is generally a, a simple, accepted annual lease that you would find at any property. And what's more important is what the income verification is of the tenants. But all of that is managed by the developer and their property manager, and then checked by us. So the government's not really involved in it. Checked by you as the lender. Yes. No, no, as the equity provider. We, we're e not debt, we're equity, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. I had now I understand the role that you play here. Okay. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All well, right. It, yeah. It's um, you know, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because no one understands what the hell we do. Uh and, and it's a very complicated niche business. And um, but yes, yeah, so there's there is debt on the property and our our funds come in as equity. Okay, great. There are All other right. questions. Um so so what's what's awesome is that Ann Zabaldo is on this call and she is truly a pioneer in the co-housing space um, mm -hmm. viewed nationally and internationally. And uh, she's saying that they're trying to create a, a, a missing middle housing in our model, the future resident partner with the developer to fund five to thirty five percent of the pre-construction costs. Co-housing communities are small, village-like, with four to 60 units. What scale would somebody need to do a live yeah. tech project? I mean, based upon what you're saying there in terms of a percentage of the cost being needed up front, that sounds like a home ownership situation, not a rental situation. Under no circumstances would any of the renters in our properties have to contribute money in order okay. to help build yeah so i'm not an expert on the home ownership side but on the but rental it, side yeah and and with a bro just a general knowledge of co-housing most of the the communities that i've seen are a uh, purchase but i imagine that there is a there's probably one or two rental co-housing models that are out there in the country and i could see where that might be um uh, the, yeah. A developer who wants to create one of those could uh, could find some leverage in this program. Yeah, and again, I think it's probably likely that nonprofits would be involved or in urban areas, perhaps. But you know, again, the point is a lot of the units are two or three bedroom units, right? So you can certainly have a co housing situation, but the combined income of those tenants can't exceed the income limit for that unit. If that makes sense. Um, great, great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, somebody, okay. G great comments here, folks. Uh, there's, uh, um, and Ann says there are a couple of rental models in co-housing. Right. Um, right. And it looks like Stephen Katz, who's on this call, is involved with a, a project in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, man, great, great resources here. So uh, we, I wonder if we're involved in his project, if it's LIHTC. Um, our, our company, to be clear, is headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm in our Boston office, which is our second largest office. But we started in Indiana and grew in concentric circles around Indiana. So that's really sort of the core of our legacy portfolio. And uh, Lexington, Kentucky is a couple of hours south of Indiana. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. Um, 
uh, e excellent. Okay. Uh, we, I, I feel like we got through most of the questions, comments that, oh, wait, I got to check. Uh, looks like, oh, let's see. Joyce is saying, could you provide a website for the CT program? I'm assuming that's Connecticut, but um, d did you reference a Connecticut program or? Um, oh, I, um, I don't think I did, but the Connecticut agency is CHAFA. They all have different names. It's C-H-F-A, Connecticut Housing Finance um, Agency. So in Connecticut, it's CHAFA, and I would go to their website and I'm sure that there are resources and links from there. And again, specifically in each city and town, there would be a housing authority as well. That's a separate agency. And the housing authorities would be a resource. So if you live in Lexington, Kentucky, you would type into Google Lexington, Kentucky Housing Authority, and you would find that one. And there's Chaffa's, right. Okay. All right. So this is also good uh, information for us all that these programs are unique to each state. Um, right. And, and you, you just highlighted something which is of interest to your to your listeners. If you scroll down a little bit, they have a first time home buyers program, too. So these agencies are not specific to just YTech. They are housing finance agencies or as we call HFAs. So there will be any number of resources that are available to your listeners in each state. Okay. So um, if you want to find the housing finance agency in your state, type Nebraska Housing Finance Agency, and 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 there you go. You know. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay. And uh, in in okay, but it, 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 Anne says. In your organization, you don't have a, a homeowner's arm. Well, let me um, let me let me talk about that just a little bit. So, of course, we're rental housing, and we talked about the program. But the program has what we call a 15-year compliance period. So, after 15 years, in most cases, the properties are preserved as affordable housing. They get what we call uh, resyndicated, meaning a new deal is done. They receive a rehab and they move on. However, in some properties, there is what we call a rent to own option, right? So this is just a program that the developer and the HFA have agreed on and tenants who stay or residents who stay in the property for a period of time can have some discount to the purchase of that unit if, you know, uh, from the rent that they've paid along the way. But um, this is a relatively small percentage of the portfolio, but it is a program that dovetails with the LIHTC program. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we've got a little bit of time left, and I want to kind of give you the, what, from somebody, your vantage point, and looking at, you know, affordability on a global basis, which is, you know, why you wrote the book. Um, right. If you had a magic wand, like what, what, I mean, we've got that yep. bill that's out there, but what are some other things that you'd like to see uh, to, to help us better take care of folks that are out there? Yeah. So, you know, a couple of things. One, um, and, you know, by way of background, my undergraduate degree was in economics. So I'm a sort of pure economist, supply demand guy. Um you know, when, and I don't know if we talked about it on this call or if it was our pre-call, Steve, but I think I mentioned that um, CPI, which is consumer price index, which is effectively inflation, right? We're all facing issues with inflation right now. 30 or 40% of CPI is comprised by housing. So if you want to address the housing crisis, you have to increase the supply. So the tax bill that we have is one vehicle for doing that, but it's not enough, right? What we need to do is have more support in D.C. What I challenge everyone to do that's listening is not ask yourself, what does it cost to provide affordable housing? It's what's the cost to our communities, our society, if we don't house people who need housing? And I want to reference, again, going back to the veterans example, I want to reference a couple of studies that were done about the cost of providing 
health care to veterans who are homeless versus the cost of providing health care to veterans who have a safe, clean, affordable house to, to, to live. And you know, just to jump to the chase, the, re, the, the conclusion from these studies was that the cost to provide health care to a homeless veteran is six times more than the cost to provide health care to a veteran who has a place to live. And that's because if they have a place to live, they don't put off the care until it's emergency. They have a place to recuperate, and they may even have a caseworker or somebody who can help them navigate the system. And all of these things lead to lower cost. If you will then consider, without getting too political, that the cost of uh, medical care to the uninsured is borne by the American citizens. Ultimately, we pay for it through taxes if they're not covered by um, insurance of some kind. And so ask yourself, would you rather pay six times the amount of health care for this individual, which is going to be more than what it would cost to build them a place to live, right? So we have to be thinking about what the cost to society is, what the cost to Americans are, what the cost, you know, we all want and need a balanced ecosystem in the communities that we live. It's not fair for you know, the, the person that we rely to drive our bus or to you know, work at the retail outlet or to hairdress a fireman or whatever to have to have an hour and a half commute because they can't afford to live in the city, right? And that creates a complicated, um, that creates a complicated system for them. So we're try I'm, in the book, I'm trying to debunk these myths that affordable housing is a handout. It's not a handout. Tenants are paying what's affordable to them. And if we have more affordable housing, we have a more balanced society. And I'll also mention, you know, I said one third of the US population is renters. The other two thirds own a home. I own a home, I have a mortgage. Most people who own a home have a mortgage. If you have a mortgage, you can deduct from your income the mortgage interest expense that you pay on that mortgage up to $750,000. So two thirds of Americans that own homes and have a mortgage are receiving a subsidy from the US government to buy that home. That is and the American dream, and there's nothing wrong with that, but please don't criticize an affordable housing program as a government handout if you're receiving a mortgage interest deduction on your home. Right, it's, it's another <laughs> way, it's, a tax based benefit. Um, yeah. That's right. So, um, okay. Couple of good questions here. I knew that a few would come in here. Um, and, and, and so Retta says, even with all the new housing being built, we still will not meet, meet the high need of baby boomers who are growing older. Um, this will be a health crisis if we don't get Congress to start talking about this. And, 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 uh, Retta, Tony and I were chatting beforehand, and he shared with me this bill that will build 200,000 more units. And, uh, you know, one of my responses is, it's like, even if that bill passed today, it's not like we snap our fingers and it's right there. And that's why, like, incentives to encourage people to share homes and home sharing, uh, yep. existing residences, opening up a bedroom and 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 things of that nature. The accessory dwelling units. Um, these you. are quicker methods, and they we we need to throw them all into a bucket. And all these options need to be out there. Um, right. Quite frankly, I mean, how are low income older adults that need care being taken care of right now? in their children's basements and the, the extra bedroom in their children's homes. Um, the, the other disturbing and challenging demographic shift is how many solo agers are out there that don't have the luxury of being able to move into their children's homes. And um, uh, and this is why we need this, this type supply, of housing. Supply, supply, supply. And, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, there's a multitude of local and state programs. There is there is Section 8, uh, you know, and the Section 8 program was designed, you know, originally specifically for seniors and disabled. There is any number of programs that can help subsidize the rent, that can help locate a home to live in. But 
the point is really well taken and it gets back to what I was talking about, which is, yes, there's a cost of providing this, but there's a greater cost to us if we don't have it. And no one ever talks about the greater cost. All they, you know, Congress just wants to talk about what is going to, what am I going to spend on this and where is it going to come from? But the HUD budget, the health and human services budget and all the other things are being impacted just as much. Yeah. Now, Teresa has a question and 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 I, I think I know where she's going with this and I may throw in something. Is this an incentive? Is the incentive to rent have to do with Medicare recouping for that is spent for long-term care, nursing care? And I, I, Teresa, I think we may be mixing apples and oranges here a little bit. Um, a tiny in- bit, but, but there's something there. I mean, again, I mentioned that there are some assisted living facilities that are financed with LIHTC. And those assisted living facilities, because of the, the demographics that we're talking about, do rely on these Medicare payments, right? But again, that kind of begins to get in a little bit into a, you know, sort of business model. But that that's tapping into, you know, something that I think your listeners are very interested in, which is the, the health services industry is realizing that they want to keep people out of hospitals. They want to keep people out of nursing homes. They want to keep people out of congregate care. And the best way to do that is to provide affordable independent living and then assisted living to the extent it becomes at that level. And so, yes, there are many constituencies that are that are saying the same thing, which is we need to provide that kind of interim, that continuum of care for seniors so that we keep them out of the hospitals and we keep them out of the nursing homes and we keep them well. Yeah. And 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 Retta, great comments. You get a gold star uh, on this one too, Retta. The, uh, she points out that in basically six years, 20% of our population is going to be older adults. And, and she says, you know, the rich know about senior housing and we're you see all of these market rate developments going up and they're selling out like they're filling up and and Retta, one of the things that i always like to emphasize is is that in history we're going to have more older adults than we've ever had okay here in about five or six years um that means we're going to have more affluent older adults that means we're going to have more impoverished older adults and that also means that we're going to have more middle income older adults and the ratios stay the same yes yeah, we know adults. why there yeah. are are the market rate being developed because if a developer gets some land they're going to build it you know maximum profit the the low income the medicaid uh the hud uh we've got programs and government agencies that are charged with taking care of impoverished individuals, but we need more incentive, you know, in this area that, that you're an expert in here, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. If I, I I don't know how much time we have, but if I have a final plea, it would be. Yeah, no, let's, let's give it, give it a go. Yeah. I would be to find some way to communicate to a U.S. Senator that you're aware of a tax bill that's on their desk that could result in an increase of $200,000, uh, 200,000 affordable housing units, and they must take action to pass that bill. I know there's many, many other things that can be done, but that is, it, it is it's almost unconceivable to us in the industry that it would pass the House with such overwhelming support and then be stalled in the Democratic controlled Senate. I mean, it just it defies you logic. You mean the Republican controlled? That, that, Senate is Democratic controlled right now. Huh. It passed the it's uh, Schumer is a Democrat from New York. He's the he's the uh, um, speaker. I'm sorry. He's the um, lead senator. It's a very thin margin, but the Senate is Democratic controlled right now. It's the House that is Republican controlled and they passed this bill 357 in favor. Wow. Oh, yeah. what's the bill number? I don't have the bill number. Oh, oh, okay. Or what's it it called? Stephen was wondering about that. It's um, the Tax Relief Act, I believe, something like that. I can find it real quick. Um, Um, Yeah. Okay. 
potentially let me see if I can. tax release act of 2024. Yes, uh, something something like that. Yeah. Okay. And again, it has two other major components. One is a child tax credit that expired, which of course hits perfectly for middle America and a R&D credit, which the Republicans love because it helps generate U.S. business. OK, I think it's H.R. 7024. Um, but 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 check check it out, folks. You can Google away. Um, all right. Well, this is this has been great. Uh, really opened my eyes up, and I can tell by the comments that opened up a lot of folks' eyes. This recorded. Uh, I'll put contact information so you can reach out to Tony if you're and his team if you're more interested in this. I really appreciate you coming on and and uh, yeah. opening your eyes to to this important uh, segment of housing that I really didn't understand uh, that well before this call. And yeah, um, yeah. I'm happy to do it. Uh, it was a great conversation. Thank you so much. And you know, as I said at the beginning, I love talking about affordable housing. So <laughs> great. And I'll, I'll make sure to put your link in for your book, folks, if you guys want to dive in deeper with this he's got the uh he's written the book so um all right thank you